أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا سيرات المستقيم سيرات الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المكذوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كل هو الله أحد الله سمت لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا ايها الذين امنوا تقوا الله كن تكاته وقولوا قولا شديدا وسعيدة الامانكم I now give thanks and I say unto your name king of kings and lord of lords the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah Amasa Yahuda Yahuda Amasta Negusto Negaste Daniel am koma ya sataya aiman na pio 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 aya we two centuries meet in the name of the most i ja at so jaja de if jaja never build up your house the builder i go build it in vain same way if jaja never watch upon your house the watchman i go watch it in vain the name of the lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and they may save he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most i ja shall therein abide under the shadow of the almighty Oh ya Allah ya Allah ya Allah subhana wa ta'ala Oh ya Allah ya Allah ya Allah ya Allah subhana wa ta'ala Yes this is the black pot au mauso bolisa au mauso bolisa adanu woto ewo asikle afo ape ape au mauso bolisa ape ape kaka ape ape this is the black pot aka kukushunamo where we speak truth to power and my name black rasta yes now in every traditional Africa, there is a black pot and each time this black pot sits on the fire there is something some shows cooking now the black pot represents the continent of africa whilst the ingredients in the black pot subjected to some amount of heating to produce food also represent us as a people on this same continent now see how it works now the ingredients are of different colors flavors sizes and even colors and smells and aromas but they agree to be subjected to some amount of heating putting away their differences because they know the food they produce will benefit some great people my brother my sister the ingredients themselves do not benefit from the food but the ingredients are happy to be enjoyed as food by some other people. My brother, my sister, this is selflessness at its best. We as a people also represent the ingredients in the black pot on the continent of Africa, which is also represented by the black pot. Now we need to be able to work together Put away all our differences so that we will be able to produce development for the next generation and even our generation. We must not continue to be a tomato planting generation. You want to plant something that you can harvest so quickly, eat before you die. We must be a tree planting generation. That generation that knows that we will not be able to live long enough to sit under the shade of this tree. Yet we are happy that the next generation will benefit from our hard work. This is the black pot, a.k.a. Kukushonomo. With this mindset, Africa will get further. Now, the biggest problem of Africa is not the problem of schools and hospitals and roads. It's the problem of the mindset. Now, if the mindset is right, everything will be all right. Alaji Banda built a whole road all because of his people. And we talked about it yesterday. 
Now, if the mindset is right, individuals will build hospitals for their communities. They will build roads like Alaji Banda. Yes, for their communities. They would even bring water to their communities. That is only when the mindset is right. But if the mindset is wrong, the government can build all the hospitals and roads. The individuals will destroy all the hospitals and roads because the mindset is wrong. So on this show, we work on the mindset of the people. We rewire the broken wires in everybody's brains so that the mindset can be made right and it can work. Remember when Nkrumah told us on the day of independence, it's time to change our attitude. This is all about the mindset. This is the black pot. We do not like to criticize anybody. and our prerogative to do that. But if we must criticize, we will on one condition, to build and not to destroy. We are in the service of God and country, and we are happy to say we are live on Pan-African TV, Africa's only Pan-African TV. Also live on Ghana Web TV, live on Loud Silence TV, and live on our own TV, Black Empire TV. And via the power of satellite, we are seen all over the continent of Africa, and of course, worldwide. This is the biggest show on TV when it comes to Africanism, and we are happy to say we are happy you have made us number one. This is the Black Pot, a.k.a. Kukushunamu, where we speak truth to power. And the very first thing I want to look at today is rolling on your screens. There it goes. It says what? Tired of life, ready to exit. Oh, my God. Tired of life. When a man reaches a certain stage where he says, you know what? I'm okay. I want to now go home. I'm just waiting impatiently for the time God will call me home. I've enjoyed everything. I have gone through life. It's now time to die. Then you want to ask yourself, wow, so is death that advantageous? Is death that important? They say so many people want to go to heaven. Yet you know you cannot go to heaven until you die. Yet nobody wants to die. Then how do you go to heaven? But in this case, this man is ready to go to heaven. He wants to die. Who is this man? He must be a poor man who is fed up with life. No, this man here does not look like a poor man. He doesn't. If this is the man that I know, then no, he's not a poor man. Roll the guns. Let's see the story. What does the story say? And this is from Ghana. Web. Come, let's read it together. Quickly, what does it say? It says, I am just waiting for my time. I no longer enjoy life. And there's a businessman talking. Aminu al Hassan Dantata, a well known business mogul who is 91 years old, has said that he no longer enjoys life and he's ready to leave this world mm, at 91. He said this when he met with Kashim Shetima, the vice presidential uh, uh, candidate for the All Progressive Congress, the APC. He said that since he was young, he had met a lot of people and made friends in all of the Nigerian states. But he can only think of about 10 of them who are still alive amongst all the people he has known all his life. Only about 10 people are alive. He said, I have been to all of Nigeria's states and done things with people from all of them. Many of them were my friends, but I can only think of about 10 of them who are still alive. To be honest, I am just waiting for my time right now. I no longer enjoy life. I hope I leave this world with a clear conscience. Oh my God. And listen to what he says. I hope I haven't hurt anyone's feelings in my life. If I have hurt anyone's feelings, I hope they can forgive me. If anyone has hurt me, I've already let it go. I am the only one of my family who still lives with my grandchildren. Dan Tata was happy and thankful for the visit. And he prayed for peace and harmony to last forever in Nigeria. May God not leave us to our own devices. We pray for his continued guidance and protection, he said. Alaji Oh my God. That's him. 
big business mogul, one of the richest men of Nigeria. In fact, now when you look at Dangote, his family runs through a very winding path, including that of Alaji Dantata. This is a business family, a family that has made a lot of money in the past, making money in the present times. Those of you who have read the story of Dangote will never end it without talking about Alaji Dantata. Now, the Dantata family is a big family in Nigeria. They were one of the few Hausa people in Nigeria to get seriously in the trans-African business, moving all the way from Nigeria through Mali, Niger, coming to Ghana and doing business like that on horseback and camel. They understood the importance of uh, inter-African business. And they made so much money. They carried things like cola nuts, cowrie shells, and so on and so forth from one country to the other on horseback, camel, and so on and so forth. When you hear the name Dan Tata, translated from the Hausa language, it simply means son of the ostrich. Tata is an ostrich. Dan is the son of or the child of Dan Tata, the child of an ostrich. These are rich people. Today he says that when he looks around life, he remembers he's gone all over Nigeria, met so many different people. But today, the memories just remain in his head. The people who he can count are alive would be just about 10. And therefore, when he remembers somebody and he wants to talk about, he would ask the next person, they don't know him. So he's like living in a different world. When you grow old to a certain point, there are things you talk about and people just laugh at you because they cannot relate. I remember when my grandfather was that old. In fact, before we returned from school one day, the only radio that was in the house and playing from his room, he sold it out. How much did he sell it? At that time, he sold it for one CD. And at that time, one CD could only buy at most a bottle of water. He sold it and he was so happy. He said he had made so much profit because he bought that radio set at just about 10 pesos. And today he was able to sell it for one CD. From 10 pesos to one CD, it means 10 times the price. But he forgot that in his days, the 10 pesos could buy almost a bicycle. But today he sold it 10 times the price and he thinks that, oh, he's made so much money, his children should come around and celebrate because he's a wise businessman. My brother, my sister, when you grow old to a certain point, people cannot relate to the stories you tell them. Anybody you mention in your story, they don't know the person. Imagine me today coming to talk about a great man who was on radio called the Kitiki Master, Poncho, Samson Quain. A lot of the youth are going to be seeing me as crazy. Who is this person? How many of the youth will remember Azigiza Jr.? How many of the youth would even remember some of these wonderful people that we had on radio and on TV? Salma Ramatu. How many people will remember her? Later Salma Valcott. How many people will remember her? How many people will remember, oh my God, the great Kote? How many of them will remember all these people? Not many. So when you live at a time and all the stories you tell are boring to people because they cannot connect, you sometimes feel like, well, you have reached there. You want to go home. This is where Aminu Dantata has reached. Come! Now Aminu Dantata has all the money in the world. He's 91 years old. He cannot relate to anything. When he misses somebody and he wishes he could go visit the person, he told that the person died 20 years ago. He remembers some other person he connected with and remembers a very good story about this person. Oh, he asks his people around, nobody knows this person. He says, well, I'm taking a trip all the way to Kanu. I'm going to meet this person. I still remember his house. He gets to Kanu 
and he sees that all the roads have changed. He cannot tell where, which is from which, where, where. The house used to be here. Say, so, oh, that house that used to be here was destroyed 30 years ago. But somebody remembers that the family moved to this place. He goes to that place and he asks of Malam Sani. Oh, then everybody starts. Subhanallah. Walhamdulillah. Walhamdulillah. Allah. Allah. Akbar. Allah. Akbar. Allah. Akbar. Walhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Say, ah, 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 yeah, merere. Why am I too? Why did they buy Allah Akbar? Subhanahu wa lillahi. Allah Akbar. He's been gone for the past 30 years. My brother, if you are lucky, you will reach that period. You will experience the pain of life. I remember we used to go to our grandfather, sit down with him, and ask him to tell us stories. He would end up telling us Anansi stories and all that. But we wanted real stories of his lifetime. One day he told us, you cannot relate. I had a friend called Mr. Henkin, who was from the British Army and came to this part of the country. And then we didn't know Mr. Henkin. He expected us to be able to pick up some things. No, we didn't. So telling us one story would have lasted 10 minutes, would last 5 hours because every step he would have to explain. When you reach that level, life is not interesting for you anymore. For instance, I was born and bred in Tamale. I go to Tamale once in a while, young as I am, only 48. Now I go into Tamale, and then some of the wonderful places I want to go to, either they have been demolished and then patched up somewhere, some of my wonderful friends. Right now, I've stopped asking of friends. The moment you ask of friends, and then you hear, hmm. Tears are about to flow. People are dying one after the other. If at 48, I have some of my friends that I started life with gone, then you can imagine a 91 year old. Now the youth might not relate to this now. But as you grow, some things will fall off. Some will follow you. And when we are telling the stories of that, those things that fell off, you may have to explain into detail how they came into being because they will not know what exactly you're talking about. Hey, Alaji Aminu Dantata. I can relate. What you're saying, I know it. You can see him at 91. He's still looking so fresh. Fresher than some 16-year-olds and 17-year-olds. Sky Abrante. With all his money, he says that this world is not my home. Oh gosh, one day he wishes he will go home and that will be his happiest moment. How do you feel if you wake up every day your prayer is that, Father, I want to go home. Father, I want to go home. I should have done this story at the end because I'm getting really emotional about this. But the prophet of Islam, and this man is a Muslim, said, Live every day as if it was your last day on earth. Ask yourself, if I die right now, am I going into heaven or am I going to dwell with Satan in hell? Yet, Muslims lead their lives as if they have 200 years to live on earth. When you wake up every day, imagine you were told that by 6 o'clock when you return, you'll be shot firing squad. Soldiers are waiting for you. You have nowhere to go. 6 o'clock they're shooting you. How would you live your life from the morning? I'm sure you go into the mosque and say like one million nafilas. The whole day you will fast. You will cry to God and ask God to forgive you your sins. If you have the opportunity, you will move from house to house and apologize to people you slapped during elections. People whose things you stole on a motorbike. People you insulted. Shege Boroba, na chimman kashege. Wawa, you would apologize to all people. But because we think we have 200 years to live, because we feel so entitled to life, we think we have it all. We have time. Elijah Aminu Dantata is lucky. He at least has lived to a point where life is no more a friend. Life is an enemy and death is a friend. Oh, hallelujah. Say it again, Black Rasta. 
Say it again. I said, Alaji Aminu Dantata has lived to a point where life is no longer a friend but an enemy. And death has become his best friend. He's going to embrace death. He's ready. He says he will live with a clean conscience. Can you live like that? Your ministers of state, can they say this? I'm ready to go home. I have a clean conscience. Your hands are bloody. You have stolen from the day you became a minister of state. All this. Your pastors, can they say that? Your malams, can they say that? You are a malam, yet in the Makaranta, the little, little girls that come there to come and learn, you are sleeping and defiling them one after the other. Sleeping with them and defiling them. You are a pastor. You are supposed to be teaching children Bible. You squeeze them. Every time they come there, nobody is watching. You defile them. To God be the glory. To Alaji. Aminu Dantata. I wish I would be in Nigeria anytime soon. And when I come, I'm going to come to your house. And I'll sit with you for you to tell me the stories of your life, even if I don't understand them. I'll be privileged to hear you talk. And I pray that I live to that point where I can also come out and say, Death, for now, is my best friend. Take me home, Father. Hallelujah. Dash it away and come. Let's look at the next headline. And what does the headline say? It's dropping. Watch it. It says what? Two police women disgraced. Two Kumasi police women disgraced. Two of them. What happened? My brother, my sister, these are the people we are talking about. When people are striving to see this nation grow, there are some urchins and vampires who are sucking the blood of the state, pulling it down. How would the nation grow? When we expect all hands to be on deck, yet some ones are at the back, pulling the nation back. And the most painful thing is that these are people we have employed to help the nation grow. And we pay them with the tax money. Police people are supposed to be the friend of people. So what is happening? What is happening? My brother, my sister, watch the headline. What does the headline say? It says, to MTTD. Police women seen collecting 10 Ghana CDs from driver interdicted. And this is one of them standing there clearly. The other one's face is hidden over there. And she is actually the bribe taker. Now the interesting thing about this story is that it's 10 Ghana CDs. Less than one dollar. In fact, less than one dollar to those of you who live in America. What does the story say? Run it. It says two police women from the Motor Traffic and Transport Department, MTTD, in Kumasi have been interdicted for an unprofessional conduct. In a video shared on social media, the two police women are seen collecting 10 Ghana CDs from a driver. It is suspected the driver was involved in a traffic offense. One of them is heard in the video saying, the five Ghana CDs the driver had earlier offered was not enough and that if he does not top up, they may decide to impound the vehicle and take it to the Asqua police station. She said they were only taking that into consideration else they would have impounded the vehicle. They ended up following the driver to go after collecting the money. They ended up allowing the driver to go after collecting the money. Now let us look at uh, the video, but watch this. It says what? A statement dated 28th December 2022, signed and issued by the Ashanti Regional Police Public Relations Officer ASP Godwin Ahiyanyo, uh, named the two affected police women as uh, private or PW, whatever it is, Inspector uh, Mata Aka with number blah, 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 and PW Sergeant, uh, uh, okay, that's policewoman, I believe, policewoman Inspector Mata Aka with number this, policewoman Sergeant Felicia Okran of the Asoka Divisional MTTD in Kumase. Their conduct has been described as unprofessional in the statement. So the police released the statement. They have been interdicted. But let's look at what happened. Bring the video. Let me show them. This is it. But I would like you to listen to what they said. I'm going to keep quiet 
and then you would watch the video. It's a very short one. You will see it. Watch it. Well, that's what it is. Two policewomen approaching, the driver sits down. If you are not careful, we will impound your vehicle. He pulls out 10 Ghana cities and says, take. But before giving it out, he took a video just like Anas Armiyao, Anas World. And when they took the money, shamelessly, 10 Ghana cities, they decided to walk away. And the driver, whatever offense he committed, can continue being on the street and commit more such offenses. After all, it's only worth 10 Ghana cities. Come. It's only worth 10 Ghana cities. The police is supposed to be taking care of some of these things. The police is supposed to watch out and be sure that the roads are safe. A driver is on the road. He has no license. You allow him to drive because he's giving you 10 Ghana cities. And these are women. Do they have husbands? Do they have children? Are their children and husbands aware? Do they have families? Are their families aware that this is what they do on the street? Is it disgraceful or it's become an in thing? Right now, police work is synonymous with taking bribes from the public, especially motorists. What kind of a legacy do you want to have for the Ghana police? That everywhere you go, the Ghana police will take money from you and unleash you onto the innocent people they are supposed to be protecting to kill you. Do you have common sense? Listen, that comedian when he came from America, remember, I've forgotten his name. When he came from America in the year of return, what happened? He said, oh, Ghana police is good. Ghana police will not shoot you and kill you on the street. If they catch you on a traffic offense, oh, he wants you pay them a hundred dollars, uh, so they let you go. Or is it ten dollars? He said, it is so disgusting. If people come in from different countries to your country, you are trying to invite them to come in and do business with you. And the biggest legacy they take out is that your police are so kind, they take bribes and let people go. Dan Parry, I expected Dan Parry by now to be doing more. I really don't want to say I'm disappointed, but the action with which the guy started, honestly, I expected more. I expected some strong earthquake, some serious earthquake in this country with the police to restore respect to police. Today, we see police people on the streets drunk on duty. We see police people who aid prisoners to run away with the promise that they will help them travel abroad. That means the police service is worth nothing. How can a policeman leave his job because somebody has promised to take him to England? Somebody has promised to take him to America to clean white people's toilets. Is that the kind of police service you... Will the American police leave America to come to Africa to see the streets of Africa? I am yet to see one crazy American police officer who do that. Why don't you want this country to have some respect? Why are you not giving this country some respect? Why are you disgracing the legacies of our ancestors? This country used to be so rich that when the white man came here, he saw so much gold, he called it the gold coast. Our ancestors fought tooth and nail to be able to put us on a certain solid pedestal. Today we are looking down on all the sweat and blood of our ancestors. You go and take 10 Ghana City bribe and allow the driver, look at the rickety car. 
that the driver was driving in. How many souls will be lost at a single accident? Because right now, even motorists, I tell you, passengers, pedestrians, do not care what kind of car they sit in. In my days, you will go around and look at the ties and see which tie is good, which tie is not good before you bought that vehicle. But today, no. Lack of cars. The transport system is so bad. Government has no buses. The ILO no buses that were brought in. We hardly see them nowadays. Tata buses grounded 70 billion years ago. Yet they want to introduce sky trains. These are crazy, mad people. Your roads are empty. You don't have public vehicles like that. You want to introduce sky trains. What kind of a euphoric thinking is this? It hurts me, brethren. Two police women, and they take note of every bribe they take. One person will take all the bribe. One person is trained in bribe taking, whilst the rest stand at the back. So when one police person stops you, they will call the bribe taker to come and negotiate and take the bribe. And they will take note of oh, 10 cities, 20 cities. At the end of the day, they will calculate how much it is and they share. You are all thieves. You have no respect for your profession. All those who do that. We need police people who are serious. We need police people who are not in the police service because they don't have any other job. So they are in the service in default. We need police people who are born police. I prefer 100 police in Ghana who will do their work well to 2 million police who are dumb and stupid. I sympathize with Dan Parry. Now I realize that the work is too much for him. There's nothing Dan Parry can do. And I'm sad. We need a revolutionary leader, not a leader who is writing grammar and sending it around for people to read. Dan Parry has failed. It pains me to, 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 you know, saying this, but that is nothing but the truth. When he came, we saw him frying both fruit on the street. We saw him frying Kelewele on the street. We admired him because the police is your friend. You should be friendly with the police. That's why he went around frying Kelewele and both fruit. It was okay. But now, it's gone, fry, it's gone beyond frying Kelewele. Right now, your boys who were beginning to behave at the beginning, they realize that you are docile. So they can play around. Kai Dampari, wake up. Wake up. You are too much in your comfort zone. In fact, I don't want to use the word food, fool's paradise. But that is where you are. Somebody will ask me, what should he do? Hey, get a team of crazy-minded police. This time is not time for sane-minded police, crazy-minded police, because the system is crazy. You can't put sane people there to deal with a crazy world. They must be crazy like them. Set them out on the streets. Plain clothes. Let them see who is taking bribe. Let them see who is misbehaving. Let them take them down one after the other. If you sack 1,000 policemen in one month, things will get better. You are playing on the job, man. Too comfortable. I've never spoken to you like this. This is my country. If it's not your country, leave. Let the country be better. We want a better country. Not a country where your police will leave and go to another country to clean toilets. Because how? As for the two ladies... You are a disgrace to your children, your husbands, your families, to the whole Ghana. You should be sacked. After being sacked, you should go to jail. You have disgraced the tenants of your work. When we return, we have more. Hey! Why <laughs>
This is the Black Pot, aka Kuku Shunamu, where we speak truth to power. And my name, Black Rasta. Yes. The truth is so bitter, but it heals. Any medicine that is not bitter is a soft drink, alewa, syrup. The truth is so bitter, that is why it heals. That is why the truth is an orphan. Many people don't want to associate with the truth because it's too bitter for them. But you must associate with the truth. We are changing the mindsets of our people. We are radically changing their minds. Take our numbers from off the screen, scrolling, and do business with us. The more businesses you bring to us, you will give us the financial muscle to do more. And your business would also be advertised. Your business will hit all the four corners of the earth. This is the biggest show on TV. True? Next item. Watch it. What does it say? This barbarism called boxing. Jesus. They say this is a civilized world. One man comes. They are hitting each other. They are hitting each other. There's no reason to fight. They are fighting because some other people are sitting down and they are happy. They want to see who is stronger than the other. Who can inflict more pain and who can take more pain. Where is the sense in this? And you say you live in a civilized world. America encourages it. How did this whole thing boxing start? It started with the knights, knights, K-N-I-G-H-T-S, knights. They rode on horses, wore armors around them and helmets, and speared each other. Another man would ride the horse, kick, 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 tick, tick, killing each other in arenas, in Roman history. And bourgeoisies would sit back and watch people killing each other, spearing each other to death. And they would clap. And these people, most of the time, were slaves. Free people who were taken from Africa and enslaved. They should fight and kill each other. To the point that they started bringing in more people to inflict pain on each other so they would be happy. It's called sadism. You are happy when other people are sad. The first black heavyweight boxer, first black heavyweight champion of the world, Uncle Jack, there was so much racism on him, how he was beating white boys. They chased him out of America. He died outside America. My brother, my sister, boxing is nothing but foolishness and barbarism. Where's the sense in boxing? That you are beating each other. Boof, 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 boof. Today, I am going to bring a story to you. And you will see the foolishness involved in boxing. Two brothers came onto the ring from the same mother. This is my younger brother. And that guy there is the elder brother. Now, you have come to a certain point where the two of you would have to meet in the ring and fight. So other people can be happy. They will see which one of you can take more pain and which one of you can inflict more pain. Boof, 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 boof. Two brothers with no sense beat each other. One fell down, boof. And senior brother starts to cry. Did they force you to go and fight? Or you are silly and stupid? Watch the story. Watch it. And this is from Talk Sport. What does it say? Family affair. Boxer KO'd his own brother and was on verge of tears after crazy fight for Japanese title. Which Vladimir Klitschko and Vitaly Klitschko refused to replicate. We all know that those brothers, Klitschko brothers from Ukraine. 
Look at them. There was a time they were supposed to meet in the ring and box each other from the same family, same father. They said, no, we cannot do that. When one of them is fighting, the other one is there to support him. But when they said, right now, you people have to come in the ring for the title and blah, blah. They said, no, we cannot do that. You can't beat your brother, but you can beat another person's brother. Look at them. They've taken a lot of bells in the ring. Bring me that story. Watch the story and see how painful it is. Kuswo Iguchi and Kaswaku Ijuguchi set a rare precedent for brothers boxing against each other when they fought for the Japanese minimum weight title. Back in 1993, the belt had become vacant with both boxers ranked as the top two contenders vying to win it at the time. The opportunity to fight for the Japanese crown was too big to pass up and so they agreed to face each other for it. The fight began in dramatic fashion as neither brother held anything back. Kusuko dominated the opening minute but was then staggered by Kasuiki Kaswaki. The older brother quickly regained control though and floored his younger brother with a series of left hands. As Kaswaki recovered to his feet, Kusuo chose not to look and instead stood with his head bowed, staring at his corner. However, when the referee waved for action to resume, there was no mercy. Kaswaki just about survived to the end of the round. He KO'd him. He fell like dead. And he started to cry. My brother, listen, the first country in the world to ban boxing, it happened in 1962, and that was in Cuba. The Cubans, from Cuba, in 1972, Sweden also banned boxing. In fact, in, that was in somewhere in 1980, yes, 72. And then in 81, Norway. So between 1962 and 1967, Cuba was already thinking about banning boxing. They banned it in the 60s. In the 60s. In the 60s. Yes, Sweden banned it in the 70s. And Norway banned it in the 80s. So 60s, 70s, 80s. In 30 years, three countries banned boxing. But boxing is food in Africa. We, we, we vent our anger. The anger that we're supposed to have for our dirty leaders. We go into the ring and beat each other to make some bourgeoisies happy. And we call it a sport. Boxing is the only sport in the world. In fact, whose main aim is to inflict pain. The aim of boxing is to inflict pain. If you can't take the pain anymore, then you stop. Boxing is a major cause of brain hemorrhage. Boxing is a major cause of brain disease. Boxing is a major cause of Alzheimer's disease. Boxing is a major cause of emotional breakdown. Boxing is a major cause of blindness. Yet we go into it for fun. You make all the money in boxing to go and treat blindness. You make all the money in boxing and go and treat Alzheimer's disease. Are we okay? Recently, some doctors came and said, oh, there's no connection between boxing and Alzheimer's disease. Go and tell that to Muhammad Ali. Ghana, when are we going to be wise and take off that dirty boxing? 
violent sport. Yet you say you are Christians. You are a Christian nation. Did Jesus box? If Jesus was going to do any footballing at all, I'm sure he would do swimming because he liked to walk on water. Yet you are beating each other. Blood coming out of your face. Look when Bukom Banku was beaten up. His face was all pechered. Blood oozing all over him. With his bleached face, he went home to treat sores and wounds all over him. My brother, we have seen people who have collapsed and gone into coma in the boxing ring. They never ever came back as full human beings again. And yet, the so-called most civilized countries in the world are involved in this buffoonery. And our sports presenters would also sit on the radio. Hey, hey, yes, Obuno, Obuno, we are punching in here. No, here no pie. Hey, no here no pie. No, bet you, bet you, my boxy bioma. Hey, hey, ekutuku, ekutuku, omu bokutuku, kutuku. Where is the world going to? I was a huge fan of boxing till I got wiser. I can tell you so many things about boxing. I know too much boxing. But since I got to that consciousness, I decided that it's not worth it. Why do you box? I leave it here. When we return, we have more. Do you know? Wayo! <laughs> This is the Black Pot, aka Kukushunemo. Hey, where we speak truth to power. Next thing. So you saw it. The least corrupt country in the world. Seychelles. CPI of what? 70. Ghana is 44. The closer you get to zero, the worse. Out of 100. Seychelles is 70. High moral standards. Corruption, no. And the most corrupt country in the whole world is South Sudan. And we all understand why. They just got created. Come on. Look at the headline. British MPs in heavy drinking sex capes. Hmm. In Ghana, we saw them beating each other, free for all boxing in our parliament house, so disgraceful. The British who claim they are the most democratic, they have their MPs involved in heavy drinking and fuka fuka. Sex. When I first saw the story, I puked. I said, Britain? They say, Britain. We say Britain. We say Britain. Look at the story and read it for yourself. Look at it. This is coming from the Guardian. It's one of the biggest newspapers in England. Very authentic. Number 10. Concerned MPs engage in sex and heavy drinking on trips abroad. Hey. Hey. I read, number 10 has said it is very concerning 
that MPs were reportedly met by sex workers in their hotel rooms and engaged in raucous drinking while on parliamentary trips abroad. Where is our Minister of National Security, Kandapa? Your brothers are at work. Your brothers are at work. Your ilk, they are at work. Kandapa was at work abroad, was modeling in a bikini. Is it bikini? No, no. Uh, 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 that thing that we wear to sleep, how do they even call it? Pajamas! He was modeling in a pajamas. I was told that a pajamas company decided to talk to him after to be their brand ambassador. He got mad and angry. He modeled in a fresh pajamas because he was ordered by a prostitute on the other side in pajamas. Oh, daddy, you are looking so good. Oh, you're looking fine. Oh, turn around, let me see. And somebody's grandfather was turned into an untrained model. He was running around. <laughs> How do I look? <laughs> oh, my God. On national assignment. That's what has hit Britain. The prime minister's deputy official spokesperson said the oversight of trips taken by all party parliamentary groups was a matter for parliament, but expressed concern about some of the behavior reported by Politico and the Times. We have seen some of the reports and some of the behavior reported is clearly very concerning. He said, the prime minister believes MPs should be working hard for the public and the vast majority are focused on trying to solve our shared challenges whether that be supporting uh, the most vulnerable or working to making our schools better and streets safer. The regulation of APPGs is a matter for the House or Houses of Parliament. And the Standards Committee is conducting an ongoing inquiry into APPGs. The process around them is a matter for the house rather than government. There has been a long-standing concern about the operation of APPGs, which often organize fact-finding trips for MPs abroad, where there can be hospitality paid for by foreign governments or companies. That's this will be the next headline. The same story, but look at the next headline. This is from the Times. The newspaper that was cited in the first story. Rishi Sunak, you know, is the new British Prime Minister. Rishi Sunak addresses MP sex and heavy drinking on foreign trips. Rishi Sunak has expressed concern over the poor behavior of MPs on foreign trips organized by cross-party groups in Parliament. Oh, you are. Dash it away. Hey! This is the Daily Mail. And they have the London Bridge there to show that this is a British story. Heavy drinking MPs indulging in sex during foreign trips are putting themselves at risk of blackmail with prostitutes waiting in ho hotel rooms when they arrive. And what are the claims? This is the synopsis of the whole story. So instead of reading the long story, these are the headlines. Claim that MPs arrived on foreign trip to find sex workers in their hotel rooms. No suggestion they knew in advance or used the services of the prostitutes. Concerns about lack of controls on activities of all party parliamentary groups. Dash! Sex is good, very good, when you do it properly and legally. Some people will tell you that they enjoy sex more when it is illegal. That is why now people are sleeping with snakes, some are sleeping with pigs, some are sleeping with little babies. 
The other day I saw a certain video that I got so nauseous about and you know, a man was penetrating a python. Are now allowing themselves to be penetrated by dogs and donkeys. All because of the illegal sex thing in mind. I don't want to go to the other side. Before people will tell me that I'm discriminating. So I leave it. My brother. Because of the desire. To take the sex thing to another level. Some people will change their gender. I feel <laughs> like a, a woman. <laughs> so just cut open here, cut here, cut here. And give me something, something. <laughs> My brother, sex is good. But some people love the adventure of sex more than the sex act itself. That's why I might probably never be able to be a Hare Krishna conscious person. Fully. Because they only have sex when they are ready to have babies. So they look at the woman's calendar. Oh, okay, this is the time we can have a baby. Pam. And they say that that's what animals do. The male goat will run after the female. It will never allow it. It will fight it. But when it's ready to get pregnant, it will be running after the male. And pam, they mate and the baby comes. My brother, my sister, British MPs, they travel outside England. On behalf of the taxpayer and the parliament of Britain. Right in their hotel room, sexy prostitutes are all in bikini. Hi, welcome. <laughs> and they drink themselves, they drink themselves to stupor. Britain. What are you showing to the world? So now you are sleeping with prostitutes and drinking heavily and you come and sit in the parliament and talk what? Gibberish. This is so disgraceful. Of course, we are used to that in Africa. Our parliamentarians all over Africa, a lot of them, they will arrange for five women for the two days that they will be away. On trips, all kinds of women, they would drink themselves to stupor. We know. We know. I really don't know what to say. But remember, no condition is permanent. Today you are in there as an MP, and then you take the opportunity to misbehave. You would find yourself down the ladder. What would be your legacy? A legacy of heavy drinking and prostituting. Like Kandapa, I don't know how he's going to redeem himself. I truly don't know. We are not angels. Sometimes, we also fall victim to one or two things, but we pray we never get back to those things. I can't tell you what those things are, but I can certainly tell you, tell you that drinking is not one of them. To God be the glory. Dash it away and bring me the last story. Now the last story, how many minutes do we have left? Now the last story, my brother, my sister, is heartbreaking. It says Ghana, actors doom. Ghana is the hell for actors. I don't know about that. I'm not an actor. In Nigeria, say actor. I'm not an actor. But an actor, one of the veteran actors. I started watching him when I was a little boy. I remember in 1989, he was involved in the Jagapi series. He's called Abeku Grina. Abeku Nyame Grina. He's a funny man. I love him. In our days, he was our hero. Recently, he was almost going blind. And he had to go on radio and beg Ghana and his fans to help him. Today, he has pathetically said something captured by City Newsroom. Watch it. 
I will prefer acting abroad instead of Ghana if I die and reincarnate. And this is Jack P. All he's saying is that <laughs> if he had the opportunity to return to this country again, he would never act here. He would prefer even acting in Togo and Afghanistan. Here in this country, lie, lie. Read the story, veteran, come! Veteran Ghanaian actor, Jagapi, has stated categorically that he regrets being a Ghanaian actor. Speaking in an interview with GhanaWeekend.com, the veteran actor asserted that whoever has chosen the acting profession in Ghana has chosen a very noble profession, but a sleazy location. Yes, in a sleazy location. He expressed his discontentment with the income and revenue derived from making movies in Ghana, adding that though the Ghanaian movie industry has not served them well, they are forging on for uh, posterity's sake so that the future leaders of the industry can possibly make a change. Dash. So that's what Jagapi is saying. In this country, don't ever think about acting. There are other people who have said, this country, if they had the opportunity to return, they would tell God to put them in another country. But listen, that's a foolish way of talking. It doesn't make sense. How can you make this country better? The other country that you want to go and act in, they also went through problems like this. They solved it. Don't be irresponsible. Come together and let us solve it. Don't sit on the fence and expect magic to happen. You sacrifice yourselves like our ancestors did to make things better for the next generation. You want to go to another man's country where he struggled and made things right. His ancestors sacrificed. Many more people are sacrificing to make it better. Then cowardly you will run from your challenges to go and sit down in a comfort zone. You are a fool. And I'm not referring to Jagapi. He's my very good friend. But whoever is thinking like that is sick. That's why I have a problem with those people who have dual citizenships. You must work it here, brethren. Make sure it works. That is why we vehemently come out and talk. If we want to be sure that it, it must work, then all the little bribes on the roads from police when you see somebody pulling you in front of the queue when you should be at the back tell them this country must work you will be at the back if you want to be in the front of the queue come early next time if you see somebody driving on the road there's traffic and he's using the shoulders of the road hazard ping 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 going stop him if you see somebody throw things on the road stop him that is the way this country would grow or else we fools would all get up one day and say we are running to America to go and live there. That is cowardly. Stay behind and fix it. I'll leave it here. Come. On this note, the answer is patriotism. My name, Black Rasta. Whoa!